Amen. 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 So we're going to be in Proverbs 24. So if you want to just bookmark something right now, because uh, we'll be coming back. We're going to be in Proverbs quite a bit tonight. Uh, quite a bit tonight. So I'll have you moving around. But I want to preach it on uh, there where it begins in verse 13. It says, "My son, eat thou honey because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul when thou hast found it. Then there shall be a reward." and thy expectation shall not be cut off. And I want to preach a sermon entitled The Sweetness of Wisdom. And You know, the Bible here, especially in the book of Proverbs, it talks a lot about wisdom. I mean, it has a lot of great things to say about it. And one of the things that often we'll find when we go through the Bible and read about wisdom is that it likens it unto honey, specifically. You'll see that several times throughout the Scripture. And really, that just kind of got me thinking, why is that? Why is the Bible... Uh, you know, liken wisdom and knowledge and understanding unto you know something like honey. And I'm just going to go through some points tonight and, and just try to draw some parallels. What, how how is it that wisdom is like honey? How is it that it uh, that what qualities do they share that are, are similar? And we'll see that wisdom truly is sweet. So of course the first reference we got here and there in verse 13 where it says, "So shall knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul." He's saying it's going to be like wisdom, or excuse me, it's going to be like honey, which is sweet to thy taste. So one of the first things we can learn about wisdom, it's like honey in the sense that it's something that ought to be desired. It ought to be something that we want. You know, we, we put, probably all in here would say we like honey, right? We would say that's a good thing. I mean, if you're, if you're one of those people that doesn't like it, then you know, probably just keep that to yourself. <laughs> it makes you a little odd, right? But most people like honey. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that doesn't like honey. I've met people who don't like fruit. I married her. So, <laughs> is that too much? Too much information? I'm like, you gotta be careful about doing that. But, you know. Now you know in the future, if you ever want to do anything nice for my wife, don't do the fruit bath. <laughs> uh, it'll all end up me. I'll be eating it. So. <clears throat> as far as I know, she likes honey, so maybe you can get her some of that. But That's just one of those things that wisdom is like honey because it's something that we should desire. Um, it, because it is good there. We would say, you know, honey is a good thing. We like honey. Um, you know, they are some of our favorite cereals. You know, honey bunches of oats. We ate that growing up. We like honey. I mean, who's going to turn up their nose at honey and just be like, ah, oh, you know, and not want anything to do with it? Well, it's the same way with wisdom. I mean, who would, who would find the source of wisdom? Who would, just like a person would walk by a jar of honey and say, oh, that's disgusting. I don't want anything to do with it. Well, who would do that with wisdom? What, I mean, what if we could set out wisdom in a pot or a bowl and say, here is wisdom? I mean, who would turn up their nose at it? Who would say, oh, no, thank you, and refuse it? Well, there are people out there that do it. In Proverbs chapter 1, I'll read it, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. So there are people out there that would turn up their, their nose at wisdom. And the Bible says that those people are fools. I mean, wouldn't you say that about somebody uh, about that, that would turn up their nose to honey? I mean, if we were to just set out a big, delicious pot of honey. I remember when I was a kid, the honey that we always had had that, that wooden thing in it. You know what I'm talking about? It had the, the little ball at the end. Is there an official name for that? Because I don't know what it is. That, that's one utensil that I've never heard described <laughs> right, with a proper name. But you would, I mean, I remember as a kid, you'd take that out, you'd put it on something, and before that thing got put in the sink, man, nobody's looking. I mean, <laughs> look at it clean, right? Because honey is good. Who would turn that up? Well, fools, you know, they would turn down, they would be just as foolish as someone turning down a taste of honey. A fool would turn down wisdom. They'd say, no thanks. And why is it? Because there's no fear of the Lord. See, honey, just it's, it's like wisdom because it makes things better. And really, that's what wisdom will do for us in our life. And that's why we should desire wisdom. That's why we should seek the source of wisdom. That's why we should pray and ask God for wisdom. Because if we have wisdom in our life, it's going to make life better. Just like if you had that plain bowl of oatmeal. I mean, who likes to just sit down and eat a plain bowl of oatmeal? No flavor in it. I mean, again, if you do, keep that to yourself. <laughs> Don't ruin my illustration, please. But we, that same plain bowl of oatmeal, we'll take it. We'll put that big dollop of honey in there. Now it's something that we'd actually just enjoy eating. Well, it's the same way with wisdom in life. You know, life is, is better when we have wisdom. The Bible says, Who despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. So when we have wisdom, when we have understanding, you know, that gives favor. 
But when we decide, to, when we turn up our, no, our nose at wisdom, we say, I, I don't need the wisdom of the Lord, I don't need the Bible, we go in the way of the transgressor, and the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And that's very true. Yeah. You don't have to look very far to find somebody who's lived their life without wisdom. And they're, you would not say they're living a sweet life. A life that, you know, you would say, what, what, what substance can I compare their life to? Honey would not be what comes to mind. You know, they are living a very bitter life. You know, and they have that look like they've been sucking on a lemon. You know, that's, that's what the, trans, the way of the transgressor does. It makes bitter, angry people because it's hard life to live like that. To live a life without wisdom. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then he must put two more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So it's a lot of times people, you know, the way a transgressor is hard and they find themselves just having to plow through life, just get through life, just one hard knock after another. It's always things coming against them. It's because they've been living their life without wisdom. But when we have wisdom, when we have the sweetness of wisdom in our life, the Bible says it's profitable to direct. And we're able to see our, our path more clearly and understand how to, uh, you know, get around certain obstacles or to avoid them altogether and certain hardships that come in to our lives. So we see, first of all, that wisdom, it's like honey because it's something to be desired and it, because it's something that makes life better. So wisdom is also like honey because it has to be found. You say, well, that's great. I think, you know, what you're saying about, about wisdom, I want some of that. Well, here's the thing. where you, you, you know, honey, you can just go down to any store today and buy it off the shelf. But back in the day, it wasn't always like that. You know, a lot of times it grew in the wild. You, you, would, you would stumble upon it or it would be something you'd have to go and find. And, you know, the point is, is that honey didn't just fall into your lap. You know, it was something, I mean, we all saw Winnie the Pooh growing up, right? I mean, eventually that it ran out and he had to go climb the tree and climb in there and, and get stuck and have the bees buzzing around and everything. It doesn't just fall into your lap. It's not, you know, <coughs> Pooh Bear didn't just like call up Amazon. <laughs> hey, bring me some more honey. It wasn't always like that, you know? <coughs> and that's the same way with wisdom. Wisdom isn't just going to come along one day and smack you upside the head and all of a sudden you're going to be wise. You're not just going to wake up one morning and suddenly have wisdom in your life. It's something that you're going to have to work at. If you would, again, keep something in Proverbs 24, but go over to Proverbs chapter 2. So wisdom is like honey because wisdom has to be found. It says in Proverbs 18, you're going to Proverbs 2, but it says in 18, Through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So you have to desire, if you want to seek and intermeddle with all wisdom, if you want to become a wise person, you're going to have to desire it. It's going to be something that you want. It's going to be something that you have to pursue and go after. It's not going to just happen in and of itself. Look there in Proverbs chapter 2, uh, two verse 1. It says, My son, if thou will receive my words. Now there's a big, there's a little word there that, ha that a lot hangs on that, those two little letters, if. My son, if thou will receive wisdom and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou shalt incline thine ear. I mean, that gives you the idea of somebody having to bend their ear and listen. If you ever notice anybody who's really trying to listen sometimes, they'll, they'll turn their ear and they'll, they'll actually do that. So it's somebody will have to actually make an effort to direct their ear to, to the source that they're trying to hear. You have to incline your ear unto wisdom. You have to apply thine heart to understanding. Look at verse 3. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, if thou liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest her for hid, as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If you want to have wisdom tonight, we're going to have to look for it. We're going to have to search for it. We're going to have to apply ourselves. We're going to have to incline our ear. We're going to have to cry after it. We're going to have to lift up our voice. It's going to be, have to be something that we really want in our lives. And if we're willing to do that, then it will come. But it's not going to come easy. I mean, that's kind of how honey is, isn't it? I mean, to us, we think, oh, honey comes so easy because we just go down to the store and buy it. But there's a lot of work that went in that honey. You know, somebody had to, I don't know the entire process behind honey making, but there's a lot of work that goes in, that's involved. You know, there's, somebody has to move those bees around to different areas for, to, for them to collect the pollen and bring it back. And they have to do a lot of work just from the, the human element, harvesting it and putting it in the jars. <clears throat> you know, it, if, it takes real patience and understanding to extract, extract honey from a hive. I mean, it's not something everybody knows how to do, and, and it's something that has to be done delicately, and it takes a lot of effort. If you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Again, 
APC because sometimes just knowing where honey is to be found, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy to get. <clears throat> you might take some real uh, discernment and ability on how to extract that honey. We would say that you know, in, in, in the physical world. Well, it's the same way with wisdom. Just because we know where wisdom is, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to extract it and apply it to our lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5. The Bible says, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. That's what, I always love that proverb. It's always made me think about a well. You know, the Bible says there, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. I, you know, he's referring to like, I believe it's referring to water that's down deep. You know, it's way down in the earth. It's very deep. Because it goes on and says, but a man of understanding will what? Draw it out. I mean, we might find somebody who has wisdom, but, you know, people who are, have wisdom, they're wise enough to know that they're just not going to utter it to everybody. They're not just going to pour out their mouth and give it to, you know, they're not going to waste their words on somebody who's going to not take that wisdom and, and use it. They keep it within. That's why it says there, it's like in the heart of man, it is like deep water. And it takes a man of understanding to do what? To draw it out. That requires effort to lower down the bucket, you know, fill it with water, bring it up and then to drink it. So the point I'm trying to make here is that just because we find the source of wisdom doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to become wise. That we actually have to apply our hearts unto wisdom, incline our ears. We have to be like that man who finds the deep water, but then is willing to also lower the bucket and patiently draw that, that water back up. <clears throat> of course, we all know the greatest source of wisdom is found right here in this book. Right. And yet today, so many people, it's like there's this big pot of honey just sitting there. I mean, it's just oozing wisdom. Right. And it's like, you know, how to go to heaven, how to live a good life, how to live a pleasant life, how to have a good marriage, how to raise children, how to have a good church, how to win souls, how to do all the works of God. I mean, it's just dripping wisdom. Right. And they're like that fool who would just turn up his nose at honey and say, no, thank you. <clears throat> and we all know the source is there, but how often do we find ourselves drawing the wisdom out of it that's, that's there for us? That's because it takes effort. It takes effort to open up your Bible day in and day out and to read it. It takes effort to be faithful to church, to hear the preaching of the Word of God. It takes effort to draw out the wisdom from the source. The Bible says in Psalms 119, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So there again we're seeing how the Word of God itself is likened unto honey, something that is desirable. Something that has to be found, something that has to be worked for to be attained. If you would, turn over to Psalms chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So that sounds like some great things that the Word of God can do for you. I mean, the Word of God, you know, the law of the Lord can convert the soul. I mean, that's such a great place to start right there. That the Word of God can save you. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's something that we can count on. You know, it's not going to disappoint us. It's not going to let us down. And what can it do? It can make wise the simple. You know, <laughs> I certainly don't claim to be the wisest man around. You know, I'm sure you'd all agree with that, right? You don't have to amen that. <laughs> but, you know, I, have, I like to think that I've attained some level of wisdom in my life to at least not make, at least I can say to the point where I've not just made a complete mess out of my life. Where I'm still profitable to some degree to God, where I can still accomplish something for the Lord. And, you know, and, it's, and I have to remind myself, we all do that, whatever we have, you know, is that which we have received. You know, all the wisdom that I, I might have has come from the from this book. Amen. It's come from the preaching. It's come from other men of God who have who have spent time reading and studying and, and taking the time to preach that word unto us. Right. <clears throat> That's what the the, uh, the testimony of the Lord can do. It can make wise the simple. Because let me tell you, I started out pretty simple, and you know, in a lot of ways, I still got a, a ways to go in that area. But you know, the Word of God can make us wiser than when we started. It says that the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and that the commandment of the Lord is pure. And what does it do? It says, enlightening the eyes. 
And again, here it's likening it unto honey, because if you recall the story of Jonathan, when he found honey, what did it say it did to him? That it enlightened his eyes as well. When he had tasted just a little of the honey. You know, just, just you know, sometimes we get busy in life, and we try to read our Bibles, we have a plan, we try to stick to it, we do the best we can, but sometimes life just gets a little busy, doesn't it? And we can't get, you know, the the 10 pages or the X amount of chapters or spend the full hour in the Word of God. We just feel like we got up late, maybe we didn't get a good start on the day, and we're behind, and we and, you know we feel like we don't have time to sit down and read the Word of God. But you know, if you just sit down and maybe just read today's proverb. I mean, that's where this sermon came from, was just from sitting down and saying, I'm going to read the proverb of the day today. <clears throat> if you just taste a little of that honey, just that little bit, that proverb could enlighten your eyes for that day. And you could go out with a little bit wiser than when you went to sleep the night before. Mm -hmm. And really, if you think about it, that's how you take in honey. You know, we we're always telling you, you don't want the kids to just, you know, ma, that's why mom puts the honey way up in the pantry, right? You know, puts the sugar way far away, puts this candy sprinkles way up in that, that remember that little cupboard above mom's stove? Right. You know, that one that's way up there, it's only that big. You had to scoot the chair over, and she'd hear the legs, like, what are you doing? Ah, busted again. How does she know? You know? <laughs> it's because they don't want you just gorging yourself on that stuff. And really, that's that's how honey is. You know, that's how sweet things are, and that's how wisdom is. You know, wisdom has to be taken in doses. You know, that's why it takes a lifetime of reading, a lifetime of listening to the Word of God, obeying the Word of God, and letting life teach you, and seeing where you can apply the things that you're learning and gleaning from it. And honey is taken in small doses just as word, God's Word is given in small doses. I mean, the Bible says here a little, there a little. You know, precept upon precept, line upon line. It's not just all at once. And that's why we have to work at it. That's why wisdom is something that has to be found. It's not something that's just going to fall in your lap. It's something that has to be worked for, just like you would honey. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 25 Hast thou found honey... Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Now that's a good practical wisdom right there, isn't it? That's just good practical knowledge from the Word of God. You know, if you can't stumble across some honey, be careful. You don't eat too much. You might throw up. <laughs> <clears throat> it is not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. So wisdom is something that has to come to us in doses. It's something that has to come us here a little, there a little, just like you would any sweet thing. Look at uh, verse 9 there of Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And what does it say in verse 10? More to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. So again, throughout the scriptures we see wisdom being, and God's word being likened unto honey. So wisdom is like honey because it's something to be desired. And it's something that has to be found. And it's something that has to be worked for. And it's something that has to come to you in small doses. And it takes a while to finish it. I mean, if you were to sit down and try to eat that whole bag of sugar, you know, it would take you a while. You'd have to stop for a while. And you'd have to wait. Some of you nodding your head. I wonder if you've actually tried this. <laughs> you know, you'd have to stop. Maybe, you know, put it aside for a while, come back. It's the same way with God's Word. You know, you, it's not something you're just going to sit down and read it one time. And suddenly have all the knowledge of all the ages of God Himself just in your mind, just ready to just dispense wisdom right. to everybody that asks. You have to keep reading it, and keep reading it, and keep reading it, taking it all in one, a little bit at a time. <clears throat> so we see also that wisdom is like honey, honey, excuse me, because it is intended that it should be consumed. The Bible says, if you would, uh, just well, I'll just read you Psalm 34. It says, "Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good." Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The Bible says in Jeremiah 15, the wor uh, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord of God of hosts. I love that verse. Why was it that the, 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 the word of God was a rejoicing of Jeremiah's heart? Because, I am, because he said, I am called by thy name. I mean, that's one of the great things about the word of God. If you're born again and you're a child of God, you know this book was written for you. I mean, this marvelous, miraculous, amazing book that can make you wise and can give you instruction in life and, and can help you in so many areas was written for you right. who have been called by, by, by name. <clears throat> so we know that this is the source. 
And, and this is sweet, and this is what we need in our lives. This is what we need to consume and, and to make us better and to uh, help us increase in wisdom and knowledge. But once we found the source of wisdom, that's when the work begins of actually extracting it and applying it, right? You know, like scooping that honey out and putting it on the piece of bread or on the toast. That, that takes effort. It takes, uh, you know, ability. So if you would, just turn over to, uh, turn over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. You say, we found the source of wisdom. God wrote me a book that's going to make me wise. You know where it's at. You know where to find the wisdom. You know where the honey is. And now it's time to extract it, to do the work. <clears throat> the Bible said, you're going to James 1, but Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. It's not enough to just know where honey is. You know, you can't just walk down the grocery aisle at the supermarket and look at the honey jar and go, oh, that tastes good. You actually have to buy it, you know, open the jar and put some in your mouth to know how good it is. It's the same thing with the Word of God. It's the same thing with wisdom. Just knowing that this is God's Word and believing that it's God's Word is not enough. He said, you're happy if you do these things. You have to actually start to do the things that are written in the Bible. If you want to glean from the wisdom that's in here, you actually have to start doing what it says. Look there in James chapter 1, verse 22. Be, but be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his face in a natural, gla natural glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but what? A doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It's not enough to just open up the Bible, read it, and say, yeah, that's what it says. And to walk away and not do what it says. If you want the wisdom that's in it, you actually have to begin to apply this to your life. <clears throat> You're there, James, flip over to chapter 3. See, there's a lot of people, they go through life and they know exactly what it is they should do, but they never bother doing it. They never bother applying what they know to do to their life. And you know what? They don't live a sweet life. They don't live a life that's blessed. They don't live a life of wisdom and instruction. They live a life that's hard and difficult. Yes, they know what the wisdom is. They know what God's Word says, but they never bother to apply it. And it's like the person who opens up that honey jar and looks at it and goes, man, that looks good and just sets it aside. Never bothers to stick their finger in and have a bite. That's the way it is with some people in God's Word. They know what it says, but they never want to really see what it's like by living it out. Look there in James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of people that would like to just raise their hand and say, oh, it's me. <laughs> oh, over here, I'm the wise one. Let me instruct you, you babes, and, and, and start to just pour out everything that they know. Let him show out of a good conversation his works. I mean, how do you know who's really wise? Watch their life. Watch how their kids turn out. Watch what their marriage is like. Watch how they are on the job. Watch how they treat other people around them. Watch what their soul winning is like. Watch what they do with their life. That's how you're going to know who the really wise person is. It's not me, the guy who just stands up and pontificates and just says all the right things and can just recite everything to you. You have to be able to observe their life. Let him show, not let him speak, not let him, uh, you know, talk, a big talk. Let him show out of a good conversation what his works with meekness of wisdom. You know, and people, you know, some people, they, they seem to know what everyone else should do, right? But they don't bother improving on themselves. I mean, a lot of people say, who is a wise man? Oh, me, and let me tell you how you can do things better. Right. You know, the person who's willing to give you a marriage advice that has a terrible marriage. My marriage has completely fallen apart. You know, here's, here's a bit of advice. Here's some wisdom for you. Don't take marriage advice from people who failed at marriage. Right. Don't take parenting advice from people who failed as parents. I mean, that sounds common sense, and we've heard it over and over, but yet people do. They'll, they'll give ear to people who are just ready to just fill their ear with, with nonsense. Because why? Because a fool uttereth all his mind. You know, the guy who's doing the most talking, he probably is lacking the most wisdom. Amen. It says, a wise man keepeth it in until afterwards. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath, hath understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Why is it? Because they just 
they speak and they speak, but we can all, what, we can observe their lives and say, well, what you're saying doesn't match up with what you're doing. Right. <clears throat> so, wisdom is like an unhoney. Why? Because it's something that we desire. It's something that we should want. It's something that will make life better. But it's also something that has to be found. And once it's found, it has to be worked to attain. It has to be applied to our lives. And I want us to understand one other thing here before we close in a moment. But honey isn't made in a day. I mean, honey takes a lot of effort that goes into it. I mean, who makes the honey? It's the bees, right? You know what they call the bees that make the honey? They call them worker bees. Yeah. Right? They don't call them uh, leisure bees. They don't call them taking it easy bees. They're worker bees. Why? Because it's a lot of work that goes into it. It's not made in a day. <clears throat> now, I did look into this part, you know. Praise God for YouTube. I figured out a little bit more about honey than made, right? <laughs> How's that made? That's one of my favorite things. You know? How do they make popsicle sticks? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many times I find myself like, how did they make that? I want to find that. <laughs> and now I'm looking it up. Anyway, I'm, getting, I'm sorry to bird walk here. But honey has a source, doesn't it? And what is that source? It's pollen. That's where honey comes from. So you get the science lesson right too. If you don't get anything else, you're going to understand that. Well, now I know where honey, how honey is made. And pollen it has to be collected, right? The, the bees, they have to fly out there, they have to find the flowers, and they have to collect it. <clears throat> and it's really interesting how they do it, how they collect it. But then they collect it, and then they have to store it, and then it has to be extracted from the hive by another person. Honey's not made in a day. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort to have good honey. <clears throat> and the way these bees do it, they go out and they, and the, and the, and they have millions, they have, well, I think this video said they have over three million hairs on their body on this tiny little insect with three million hairs on it. And they even have hair, we were, somebody was joking about this, this before the service, I didn't even realize until now, but about that statement that's been coined, I believe by Pastor Anderson, that somebody needs to have hair on their teeth, uh, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, we need some men with hair on their teeth. Well, bees have hair on their eyes. You didn't know that. Wow. They have so many hairs, even their eyes are covered with hairs. And they go out and they collect all that pollen and they just roll around in it and it all gets and then they take their legs and they just move it all back and they move it onto the back of the, there's a back legs just get loaded down with honey. And they carry one third of their own body weight in pollen. Wow. And they do that multiple times, back and forth, back and forth. I mean one third of their body weight. You know, I'm not going to ask how much you weigh, but I know what one third <laughs> of my body weight is, you know, and that's... It's not light. <laughs> I mean, if I was asked to carry one third of my body weight back and forth these distances, I'd collapse. I couldn't do it. But yeah, these bees do it, don't they? <clears throat> and what do we learn from that? Is that God doesn't give wisdom to lazy people. God isn't just going to give you wisdom just because you're tired of your life uh, not being good. Because you're tired of living like a transgressor. You say, my life is hard and I want wisdom. God, give it to me. It's still going to take work. God's not just going to say, oh, I feel sorry for you. You're, you're so pitiful. Let me just give you some wisdom. I mean, it's too good. To just, I mean, would you just throw your honey out to every bum that asked it? No, you wouldn't. You know, we don't do that. And lazy people, they don't get wisdom. They have to work for it. And why is that? Because lazy people won't do anything with wisdom. Why would you give them wisdom? They're not going to do anything with it. They're just going to continue to be lazy. Now, if you would, turn over to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. <clears throat> Where this is, a, I think, a great example of this, of the fact that God doesn't just give wisdom to lazy people, but He actually gives it to people who are going to use it for His glory and for His honor. Look here in, in uh, Exodus chapter 31, and verse 1. The Bible says in Exodus 31, 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled them with the Spirit of God and wisdom and an understanding and a knowledge and all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given uh, with him uh, Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted have I put wisdom, that they may make all the things that I have commanded thee the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and the furniture and the pure candlestick with all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture with the laver and his foot and the clothes of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons the minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do and the Lord spake unto Moses saying Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, 
for it is sign between me and you throughout your generations. So we see that God has a lot of work for these people to do. I mean, did you, did you catch all the furniture, all the instruments, all the oil, all the garments, the tabernacle, the tables, the cutting, the timber, everything that God had somebody to do. He had a lot of work. And who does he give the wisdom to? He gives it to, in verse 2, I, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and I have filled him with the spirit of wisdom of God. Of God. So he gives wisdom unto this guy Bezalel to make all these things, to do all this work. And I'll guarantee you think one thing right now about Bezalel. He wasn't a lazy guy. Bezalel was a guy we know for a fact, at the very least, was uh, was following Moses. That he was... Uh, I'm missing a page. I think of, yeah. Can you bring that up here? <laughs> Thank you. Boy, this this almost took a major dive up here. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so anyway. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But Bezalel, we know for a fact that he was a guy that was following Moses. Right? And he was working. He was traveling. He, I guarantee you this is a guy who was already getting his hands dirty. And what does God do? He gives them wisdom to do what? Sit around and let everybody know how wise he is? And just tell everybody else how to get the job done? No, he gave him wisdom to devise, to work, to cut stone, to set stone, to carve timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. I mean, he said, I'm going to give you wisdom, Bezalel, and then I'm going to put you to work. So, you know, God isn't going to give wisdom to a lazy person. God's going to give wisdom to people he knows that are going to get the job done. Bezalel is a guy who went out and he got his hands dirty. <clears throat> and I, you know, and if there's anybody that desires to be in ministry in any length, at any sort of all, and I know there's guys that do. And this is something that I learned from my pastor back in Michigan told me, was that getting in the ministry is getting your hands dirty. And I remember he always kind of, these traveling evangelists that would come through in their RV, you know, they're retired, they got the RV, and they're all slicked back, and they, they've got their pocket full of messages that they preach. And they just go from church to church. And he, he, he didn't say ever say anything bad about him, but he, sometimes he confided in me a little bit, and kinda, he kind of let on that it, it irritated him a little bit, these guys. And he explained to me why. He said it's because they never get their hands dirty. They just go from church to church and just preach a nice message, right. a nice polished message, and get a love offering. And drive across the country and take in the sights and go to the next one and so on and so forth. They never sit down and get involved and you know what? Get their hands dirty. Doing what? Doing the work of God. Right. Getting in and getting and getting in the yoke with other people. Going out and doing the work and uh, you know, getting in there and getting it done. And that's who God gives wisdom to, is the people that are going to get their hands dirty. They're gonna be like Bezalel and actually accomplish something for God. And really that should tell us this that wisdom is something that's earned. It's something that God gives to us. You know, just like we would reward our children if they do the right thing with maybe some honey or something sweet like that. It's the same way with wisdom. God isn't just going to just dole it out uh, with no questions asked. He's going to see who's actually going to do something with it. <clears throat> I should have had you stay in James, so I'll just read it to you. It says in James 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, and entire, wanting none, nothing. Now everyone knows, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And people all know verse 5. They know, oh yeah, if you need wisdom, you just ask God, and he gives it to you. But here's the thing about verse 5. It follows verse 4. And you have to get it. It's connected to the preceding verses. And what goes on in those preceding verses? Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when what? When you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, but let patience have her perfect work. You know, you get wisdom as you need it. You get wisdom when you're in a position where it's required. And, you know, wisdom is being given to those who ask, yes, but are also in a position to put it into practice. It's not just people who just want to be wise so they can feel like they're wise or sound wise or appear wise. It's people who are actually going through temptations. People who are actually having their faith tried. People who are actually uh, you know, letting pa oh, uh, 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 patients have her perfect work in their life and actually have a sincere need for wisdom in their life. That's where wisdom, who wisdom is going to be given to when that person asks. Not just every guy who asks, but the people who are actually in a position where it's needed. Wisdom isn't given to lazy people who just want sound wisdom and just to sound wise. If you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 16 and we'll close there.
Proverbs chapter 16, the very beginning of verse 21. Proverbs 16, verse 21, the Bible says, The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of thy lips increaseth learning. I read it again, verse 21. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. So it says there that the wise in heart shall be called prudent. And what does it mean to be prudent? Well, it means to be discreet. It's somebody who has, you know, they're, a little, they're discreet people. They're not people that are just going to make a big noise or make a big fuss. You know, it's the type of people that don't need to prove anything. They don't need to prove that they're wise. They don't need to go out and, and uh, you know, prove to everybody and convince everyone that they're the wisest or that they have wisdom. And yet, they shall be called prudent. You know, the, wise, the wise in heart shall be called prudent. They'll say, well, that, that person's very prudent and he's wise in heart because uh, of the fact that it's their life that shows it, as we discussed earlier. People can sit back and observe an, an individual's life and say, that person has wisdom. And you know what else that person doesn't do is go around and just try to convince everybody else how wise they are. <clears throat> In verse 22, it says this, Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instructions of fools is folly. You know what's interesting about that is it says that fools give instruction. Yeah. The instructions of fools is folly. There's plenty of people out there that are fools that will just tell you exactly what to do. Right. That will give you all the advice that you want. <laughs> They're more than happy. I mean, just get on social media yeah. and, and start asking questions. You'll go into some group somewhere and ask a question and just... You just want, I'm not saying everybody that's on there is a fool, but there's a lot of people that just jump on right. and just start giving out their two cents. And a lot of times you hear what they say and you're like, you know, I mean, what's one area? Well, you just pick any area of life. I mean, child rearing is a big one. I mean, child rearing takes wisdom. You're going to need help from God in child rearing. It takes uh, discernment and how to raise a child right and, and how, when to chastise and when to be gentle and all of these things. But, you know, and even, even, to, even to do the chastising. Some people are such fools today, they don't, even, they don't even believe the Bible that says, thou shalt beat him with a rod. You know? They don't even think that you should spank your children. What do they, what do they promote today? You know, time out. <laughs> Just put them in time out. Time out doesn't work, friend. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work. And I know because I've had relatives who tried it. You know, and remember the, my, I alluded to the illustration of the candy sprinkles in that little cupboard? Little, little junior, I know someone, got the chair over and mom didn't hear it. And got up there and she came down and, and, and he's standing on top of a gas stove and he had taken all the oil out and poured all the oil around him. Diaper full, all just inches of oil. They had to get a new stove when they were done. There was so much oil. Flammable oil on a stove with the child standing in the center of it. And what was he after? The sprinkles. Right? And you know what he got? Time out. I said, why don't you spank him? Oh, I tried that once. He just laughs at me. <laughs> You're not doing it hard enough. You're not doing it right. So that's it. That's the wisdom of the world. But they But you know what? I guarantee you that person had somebody saying, "Oh, you're right to have done it that way. Mm -hmm. You're perfect." I mean, I mean, thank goodness your son didn't, you know, trip on, turn the stove on on the way up. Right. And what a tragedy that would have been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, there was somebody out there that said, "No, timeout's the way to go." And that's why you come home. And the dog, he's taken all of the condiments out of the fridge and poured them on the dog. <laughs> I, mean, I know we put ketchup on a hot dog. <laughs> this kind of hot dog. We don't put them on a literal dog. <laughs> but that's the type of thing. And this is just one area in life, child rearing, where there's a lot of fools out there that will give you all the instruction you want. They've got, they'll sell you all the books you know, about money, about child rearing, about marriage, about any area of life. There's the instruction of fools. And they'll instruct others just as much and more so than the wise people. Why? Right? Because it says here in verse 23, The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth, and addeth learning to his lips. You know, the wise person is more concerned about making himself wise than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And the wise have learned things from themselves before they go out and teach it to others. That's how they know it's good. That's how they know it's right. They read the Bible. They say, that's what the Bible says. Let me make that a part of my life. And once they see that it works and they know it's good and they know how to do these things, then they go and tell somebody else. They're not just uttering everything that they think is wise. They've learned it for themselves before they teach others. Look there in verse 24. The Bible says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, 
sweet to the soul and health to the bones. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, there's the way that sounds right, but it's not, it's not going to end in anything good. So just to conclude, what, what is the sermon about? It's the fact that wisdom is pleasant. Wisdom is to be desired. Wisdom is like honey in all these different ways. And really what we need to do is just consider the source, really, is what the, the last point I really want us to understand is that when you're looking for wisdom, if, you know, if you're somebody who's willing to put in the work, to do something with the wisdom that's given you, and, and you're going to God for it, and, and you know where the wisdom is to be found, you need to consider the source you're seeking it from. <clears throat> because we can find it. There's a lot of bad sources of wisdom out there. I mean, you think about honey, and, and you think about bees, right? There's bees, and then there's wasps. And as far as I know, wasps don't make honey. You know, a wasp lives in a nest, mm -hmm. and what does a bee live? He lives in a hive. Mm -hmm. But they both make the same buzzing sound, don't they? And then you could look at them in the distance and say, you can't really tell which one's which. So we need to really understand which one's which, which, which source are we going to? Because if you get in the nest, you're not going to find honey. You're going to, find, you're going to get stung, and it's going to hurt. And you know the interesting thing about wasps is they can sting repeatedly. Yeah. And whereas a bee you know, can only do it once, and then he dies. <clears throat> you know, the wasps out there, the fools that are just going to pour out all their wisdom, all they can, at the end of the day, all they can give you is a life of pain. And if we want real wisdom, if we want the sweetness that's found in real wisdom, we have to find it from this source right here. Amen. And we have to understand that God's not just going to give it to anybody, but it's going to be something that we sincerely want, something that we're sincerely going to work for, and something that we're actually going to apply to our lives. Let's go ahead and pray.